Another uh, feature that you saw uh, premiered with this model was the 3085 movement, which you also saw used in the GMT Master II. Uh, it allowed you to independently adjust the hour hand and so you could really use this as a second time zone watch instead of just an AM PM indicator that you saw on the 1655. Angel sitting next to me here at Swiss Watch Expo can't quit obsessing about this watch. She uh, has it on her screen. It's her screensaver. She uh, spends uh, an inordinate amount of time looking at this watch throughout the course of the day. And it's interesting because she doesn't even understand why she's so obsessed with it. But uh, I tried to get her to, to give me a little bit of that, uh, why she has that root of enthusiasm for this particular watch over all the others that you have on the website at Swiss Watch Expo. She can't really explain it. I think it's just the rarity that it is so unusual. This is a watch that replaced the 1655 Explorer, uh, the Steve McQueen, which was kind of a, a watch that was released in 1971 with, without a real purpose. Uh, it was the, the Cave Dweller watch and uh, really kind of a flop when it first was released, which is why it's become so popular now as a collector's item. Generally, what you see in the Rolex world is things that are not real popular at the time, a lot of times become really popular as collector's items. You see that with the early Daytonas, the Paul Newman Daytona, uh, the, uh, a, a lot of their watches, the ones that are maybe not as popular at the moment, are the ones that might be the ones to invest in. So think about that when you're, when you're choosing a watch out of our collection. But uh, when they decided to upgrade the 1655 and they changed the whole look of the watch, they really were uh, entering a different phase for Rolex from just the tool watches to luxury watches. Even the, the luxury sport watches uh, on the 16550, as this one was known, they upgraded things like they went to a glossy dial finish. They went to 18 karat white gold surrounds for the, uh, the hour markers, the batons or the circles on this one, the hands. They really made that transition. Uh, they went to sapphire crystals. They, they did a lot of things that really raised the bar for what a sport watch could be. One of the things that they did at the time, and we talked about this a lot, is that they used to sub out the dial production. And they used a couple of different dial companies at the time. And any time that they were not 100% in control of every single aspect of production, there were things that ended up being little variations, differences in the fonts, differences in the way the markings were laid out, and a lot of times differences even in the finish itself. <clears throat> so for the first time, you could get a sport watch with a white dial with the 16550 Explorer II made from 1985 to 1989. So this was the first Explorer II um, that really first sport watch from Rolex that you could get any color dial other than black. So you'd think that that would have been a popular choice, but it really wasn't at the time. But the black dials and the white dials, they both have finish problems that show up over the course of years. With the white dials, what you see is this fading to a creamy yellowish ivory color. So there's a lot of different names that they use for this. It might be vanilla cream or lemon cream or iced vanilla or iced lemon or vanilla pudding. Uh, I'm not sure what the nickname will stick with this one, but it's a really interesting look because the, the dials have faded over the years. Rolex, of course, would have wanted to catch this at the service center and replace it with a service dial later that was a stable white but here's one that never made it to the service center, never got changed out. Not only is it this beautiful creamy ivory color, but the hands and the markers match absolutely perfectly. There's a, a, the later versions with the, the white, white dials, they had black outlines to the loom plots and the hands. So you saw a lot more stark black and white when you looked at the watch. This one is just kind of all creamy because those white gold accents were not covered in black paint. Uh, so not only that, this is a very rare one because it is what they call a rail dial. So if you look closely at the dial, 
where the second set of text is right above six o'clock where it says chronometer and certified, normally those words are centered in the dial and so they don't line up with each other. But on the rail dial, the C's of chronometer and certified line up perfectly and it almost looks like a little railroad track there. So that's why they call it a rail dial. So this one's doubly rare because it is a rail dial and it's the original dial that has faded to a beautiful ivory color. They don't all fade at the same rate. They don't all fade to the same color. No two are exactly alike. This one's one of the most delicious, best looking examples I've ever seen. So when you're looking at this watch, um, you know, there's a lot of advancements to it. They switched to the 3085 movement, which you saw in the GMT Master as well. So for the first time, you could independently uh, or rather the GMT Master 2, because you can independently adjust the second time zone. Now, instead of just an AM PM indicator, this is uh, useful as a second time zone jet set traveling watch, but it also has that heritage of being made for spelunkers and people losing track of time in the dark caves. Um, it's just all around such a rare watch and such a great find. And one of the rarest watches that we've got in our collection here at Swiss Watch Expo. Um, hence, you know, it is a higher price than you would see probably for any other Explorer 2 we've got in stock. But considering the collectability, the rarity, the incredible level at which this one's been preserved uh, all around, just probably a, a fantastic investment for you for the future.